Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Let's be getting started here in another minute or two. Let's give a couple extra moments for people to join on in and to get all settled. And then we'll get right on started with uh, tonight's Meet the Artist with John Fowler. <clears throat> okay, so we'll go ahead and get here. So good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us this Friday for Meet the Artist, part of our Quarantunes digital performance series, highlighting and celebrating the diverse traditions of South Carolina. My name is Ian Halligan, Folk Life Program Coordinator for the McKissick Museum at the University of South Carolina. During Meet the Artist, we will be sitting down with performers in our Quarantine series to learn more about the art forms represented, as well as the performers themselves. Audience members are welcome, as well as encouraged, to, to submit questions by typing into the chat box at any time throughout this talk. I will relate these questions then to the artist directly. Before we begin, I would like to thank the South Carolina Arts Commission for their support of this evening's event. Meet the Artist and Quarantunes would not have been possible without the Folk Life Partnership Grant, which the Arts Commission provides McKissick to amplify their traditional arts programs. With that said, I am joined tonight by John Thomas Fowler. John is a mountain heritage storyteller, award-winning musician, and author from the foothills of upcountry South Carolina. His storytelling combines a wonderful anthology of Appalachian folk tales, fairy tales, outrageous tall tales, and contemporary yarns with traditional songs and ballads. He has been a featured teller at Stone Soup Storytelling Festival, the International Storytelling Festival Exchange Place, Madison County, Florida Storytelling Festival, and is the host teller in residence at Haygood Mill Storytelling Festival. In addition to the accolades enjoyed from storytelling, John is an equally accomplished musician. He is a two-time harmonica champion at Fiddler's Grove Old Music Festival in Union Grove, North Carolina, and he has also received blue ribbons in the banjo competition at the prestigious Mountain Dance Folk Festival in Asheville, North Carolina, and the Piggins Heritage Day Old Time Music Festival. John also received the Folk Heritage Award in 2013. Again, please feel free to ask questions at any time, and John, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. It's great to be here, and uh, thanks for putting on this wonderful event. I hope I uh, can give you a bunch of information. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, let's start. Let's start early here. So I was very curious that your family was from the mountains of North Carolina. Kind of what's the history there? I'd love to learn more about that. Uh, this gosh, there's a lot of history there. Both uh, my grandparents, uh, grandmothers, and grandfather was from the. Uh, from the hills of uh, Western North Carolina, and of course, my one of my grandmothers from Tennessee. Um, my uh, my grandmother on my father's side, they came down in the mid 1920s or so, um, maybe a little bit earlier than that. I'm gonna say around 1920. Uh, he was a Baptist minister, and somehow he got the calling to go to uh, Glendale Church to to preach. He was a big, robust man. Just uh, they said he was a powerful man, and apparently had a loud voice. And people to this day tell me that they, they could, you could drive down the road, or you could hear him, you know, way down the road preaching in the in the church. He was so loud. Of course, they didn't use uh, didn't use speakers or anything in those days. So I guess during the summertime, a lot of people got preached to whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, his claim to fame was that he could um, he could float on water, and he was a man of about 300 pounds, so that must have been kind of amazing uh, to see a preacher floating on water. Uh, uh, so, you know, he'd take his Bible and float around, and he'd, he'd say, Jesus, walk, but I can float, you know, things like that. You know? So I can imagine uh, in those days uh, when they had the baptism at the old Packlet River. Uh, everybody came out, all the denominations came out because they wanted to see if he was going to float or not. You know, I don't know. But he was, uh, 
he was a big old man and, and he came to Glendale and preached there his entire life. So that was his last place, last church. And of course, my grandmother was a little girl at that time, but she went to work in the mill, textile mill, textile mill uh, when she was 15 years old. Her, and I find this kind of interesting. She, she didn't, uh, you know, go and apply for the job or anything. Uh, she just went with her sister and they gave her a little something to do. She, her job was to fill batteries and batteries were uh, where the where the bobbins were at, had to keep those filled so to keep the, uh, uh, keep the, uh, the work going. And um, she apparently did a pretty good job because at the end of the week, the paymaster came along and gave her uh, her money for that week, she got paid a dollar a day, and that would that would equate out to about ooh, uh, I guess 10, 10 or twelve cents an hour, depending on how long she worked. So I always thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, she never was told she was working, except when the paymaster came along, along and gave her the gave her the money. So that's how she she came here. She got married when she was oh about eighteen years old. My grandfather and. Uh, and they were married like forever and a day, you know, just just till death did them part. Um, my grandmother Taylor was from very western North Carolina and um, up around Murphy, North Carolina. And she was she was born in 1898, and she was one of the younger ones. And the family, for some odd reason, she was given the responsibility to helping mom out and getting everybody ma uh, married off. And so she was the last one to get married. And I asked my granny one, one time, I said, well, how old were you when you got married? And she said, I was 22 years old. And I said, that's pretty old. And she she kind of looked at me and, you know, I learned, learned that point never to... Uh, speak with a woman about her age. But anyway, she, she went on and got married. And then later on, uh, her husband sadly died. They had one child. And, um, and so she was pretty much thought she was going to spend the rest of her life uh, alone because she was in and around, uh, you know, Murphy, uh, that part of, of uh, North Carolina were very secluded. Um, hard to get in, hard to get out, and it was old, old mountain mountain folks. But some for some reason, my grandfather was uh, uh, in Spartanburg, and he was up visiting, and the story is he was looking for a wife. His wife had died uh, also in the late 1920s, and uh, he uh, was introduced to my grandmother, and, I, you know, it wasn't like one of those Friday night or Saturday night things where you come to Spartanburg and go over and date her for six months or a year. It must have happened pretty quick. And uh, he asked her for her hand in marriage. And uh, of course she accepted. Well, they went over to Asheville and got married. She got to ride the train for the very first time. She never rode the train. It's a funny story in my family. They asked my grandmother, why did you marry him? You know, she said, well, I never had, I never got to work right. I, I never rode a train my whole entire life. So I thought I'd, I'd like to ride the train. So she came to Spartanburg and uh, she, my grandfather hadn't had a little money in a big farmhouse. As a matter of fact, this picture up here on the wall is a, a painting my brother did of the farmhouse. And uh, upstairs, downstairs, had electricity and all sorts of kind of things. And um, my grandmother had never experienced electricity. And there's a story in my family that uh, she thought electricity was a little bit like gas or something. So she was afraid it would leak out. So she went around and, and sewed these little socks she put on all the receptacles in the house. You know? And um, so kind of funny story there. And they, they had a couple of children uh, in the late 1930s. One of them was my aunt. Uh, Faye and then my grand, uh, my mother came along in 1937. What's what's really kind of crazy about this whole story that I'm I'm kind of telling you here is um, when my grandmother married my grandfather, she was about 40 years old, so she was having children in her 40s. You know, they're about well, late 30s or so. And um, uh, my grandfather, when he met my grandmother, he was 70 years old. So my grandfather fathered uh, my mother in 1937 when he was uh, like 77 years old or so. 
and uh, that's sort of kind of uh, amazing. And that's that's why I'm here today. <laughs> and so my grandmother, um, uh, he he passed he went passed away in the early 1940s, and my grandmother stayed in this house up until the early early 1960s. So that's kind of a little bit about my background history as well with all three of my grandparents. <laughs> well, that's great. It, yeah, it seems like there, there's a ton of, ton of history here throughout that entire, you know, family as well. You know, was anyone in the family very musically oriented or played any instruments or, or sang at all? Oh, uh, yes and no. My grandmother's on both sides. I would say my grandmother Ballard uh, would have told you that she just didn't have any uh, any time for that nonsense, and she was she was a nose nonsense type type of woman. Uh, and my grandmother sang a few songs, but never played any musical instruments. So getting it directly, absolutely not. But she, interesting enough, my grandmother. I never experienced it, but my grand uh, my mother tells me that she spent. Uh, well, she would sing old Scottish type songs and everything. So I'm assuming she might have got that from her mother, her family as well. It was kind of a hand me down type of thing. And uh, but I never never experienced that. I got a lot of my music interests from my mother at the time of the late 1950s, early 1960s. And a big folk music scare was was around. And of course, my mother grew up hearing some of the earlier folk tunes, just just being in the area of uh, Spartanburg. And I'm just I just assume that I connected with that, and also connected with my Appalachian heritage as well. So, do you remember kind of your earliest inspirations for this music, either artists or anything related? My earliest, I think it's Wallow Water. Earliest times I remember playing out on the front porch in the house behind me. Um, and grandma would have a little white radio turned on and I heard some music. I must've been about five years old or so. And that would be my first connection to any of the early music of the time. I don't remember what I was listening to. Uh, later on, my stepfather was the one that played the guitar. I would call him a folk singer. He played anything that felt good. He was a three chord musician, never used a, a capo or anything like that. So uh, he set me down when I was about eight years old and showed me how to play the the dreaded D chord and a G, G and A. And then I, I kind of took it from there. But he played a lot, a lot of songs. What amazed me about him looking back was his name was Bobby Smith. Uh, was he learned directly from listening to the radio. I never ever recall him writing any music down or any any of the words down. And um, and he knew the old folk songs as well, uh, the, the Carter family tunes uh, and all sorts of kind of things. And just when I thought I'd heard it all, he would come up and, you know, come up with some other other tunes I'd never heard. So I heard John Henry from him uh, and those kind of tunes, uh, Takes a Word Man, uh, of which I learned very young and still play to this day, old Carter family tune. Or much older, uh, and there were many other tunes as well. So Bobby Smith gave me my kind of first uh, actual feel or lesson on the guitar. Somehow I got an old guitar, and uh, I would go up and down the streets. Uh, at that time, we lived in Spartanburg. We actually lived in kind of a poor section of Spartanburg. And uh, so I would go up down the streets and play for people that were sitting out in, uh, on the porches and things. And I only had, I only knew about three songs, so the concert was very short. <laughs> he, uh, uh, so I, I, I'm sure my guitar was probably not, you know, in tune for all the concerts, but I got, I got, you know, my, uh, 
you know, people applauded for me. So I went to the next one and the next one. And uh, so that's my first experience with, uh, with playing the guitar. Later on, uh, when I was 13, 14 years old, I began experimenting with songwriting. Uh, did a good bit of that. And that's where I picked up my second instrument was my harmonica. And uh, I guess, you know, I strapped it to my, uh, you know, harmonica holder and began playing a little bit with that and still do to this day, use it in my performances and all sorts of kind of things as, as well. Do you remember your first show and the first show that you ever performed? You know, you would think people would remember that. And let's see, uh, first show ever performed by myself would have been, uh, you know, when I got it, uh, when I got in high school, I was the guy with the guitar, with the uh, with the acoustic guitar. There were a lot of other folks that were experimenting with the rock and roll type, type music and everything, but I was playing the more acoustic type stuff. And my first experience where I really thought that it, it was important, it meant a lot to me, was uh, my, somebody had told my English teacher in 12th grade, they said, well, he plays guitar, he's pretty good, this, that, that other thing. And she said, well, come and play some tunes for him. And she was, she was young, I would say she was in her 30s or early 30s. And um, so I went and played, uh, and this was in the, mid 1970s so i went and played um you know some older folk tunes i played some bob dylan for her and uh, uh simon and garfunkel and, and, and those kind of that, that kind of stuff there and then some woody guthrie tunes and she was sort of kind of perked up all of a sudden she was like uh there was a connection there and we're talking about the mid 70s as well so and uh, she told me, she says, have you ever heard of John Prine? I, I, at that time, I, I, no, I wouldn't discover John Prine for about another year, a year and a half. She said, well, check him out too, you know, but she was very impressed. So I didn't get paid, but uh, I would say that was one of the first real memories of playing for somebody that was older, that really appreciated the music and, and, uh, uh, connected there was some kind of intellectual connection with me playing music that she was more associated with in a way i guess mm -hmm. so so you first started out kind of learning carter family songs and, and kind of other similar tunes when did you start getting more or delving more deeper i should say into into other songs and you know when did you really you you would feel get super uh, interested in this in this form of music or in old time music. Oh, uh, I uh, I guess I was building a foundation when I was in high school and carrying my guitar around, learning some of those songs. I learned some of the pop songs of the day as well. Oh, uh, and I started messing around with the banjo a little bit in high school, but I didn't know exactly what I was doing. And I wasn't connected with the bluegrass music as, as much. Uh, I just, you know, just wasn't there for me. It would be later on. Uh, it wasn't until I was uh, about 20 years old, I connected with uh, a more folk type music with Pete Seeger, uh, the banjo player that he, he did. Then I, I knew kind of what I wanted to do on the banjo. And so I started learning that claw hammer style. And of course, it's kind of like building blocks. Uh, one, one thing leads to another. And then, uh, you know, stumbling in, uh, stumbling along and finding friends that play similar type music. So that's kind of how it started with me on the banjo. I, it took me several, it took me a little while to learn that claw hammer banjo. At the time, I didn't realize that there was a Pete Seeger book out there that may have showed you. I have the old one here now. Uh, and of course, there wasn't any videos or any anybody could teach you that. Uh, I went for many years not knowing anybody that played claw hammer or folk banjo. Uh, and uh, that's kind of where it started. So I started putting some of that together, my guitar 
music and my banjo playing all together. And uh, then it all connected. And during this time that you're playing music, you know, are you also starting to get into storytelling or does that come later in life? Uh, storytelling was always something I, I, I guess I was very talented with when I was growing up because I could, uh, I could, I could tell you a story <laughs> and uh, I could get in trouble for it too. But uh, I was, I was pretty good at explaining, you know, how, why, and absolutely not knowing anything that I'm talking about. And as I got a little bit older, uh, I connected with, uh, with some stories. I remember learning all of Guthrie's uh, uh, story and for word for word, Alice's Restaurant and playing it. And somewhere around 1980, I started discovering uh, that there, there was a market for storytelling. And I went and saw a few storytellers as well. And I thought, well, wow, I can do, I can do that. And, and then I, I started realizing that when I was younger, back when I was about seven or eight years old, uh, some, me and some of the other kids in the neighborhood would sit around and uh, at nighttime on somebody's front porch or outside, especially in the summertime. And, uh, stories like uh, Big Hairy Toe and Taylor Pole and, and Golden Arm, all those little standards. And I realized that uh, I had heard a lot of these stories that I was listening to from storytellers as well. Uh, and so somewhere in the 1980s, I, I started giving it a try and it really connected, connected real well. And it still, still does today. And that's how that came along. Another building block, you meet some people. And then I discovered the uh, International Storytelling Festival that's held every year in Jonesboro, Tennessee. A great little festival to go to. I call it little, but I say somewhere around 20,000 people all over the place come and, and go to this festival. And one of, one of the eerie things about that festival, unlike a music festival, because I spent years to go to these old time music festivals back in my 20s and 30s all the way up, uh, you could get up no matter what time, no, no matter what time of night it was, when you're at these festivals, you can get up and go join somebody and jam. You know, three o'clock in the morning, can't sleep, you know, maybe I'll just you know, grab my banjo and fiddle or something and go down and find me a jam. That was easy to do. So there's always music in the air all over the place. The daytime was just constant music, all these camps and everything. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that or experienced it, but it's just, it's just wonderful. The storytelling festival is completely different uh, in Jonesboro, for instance. And there are other festivals like this as well. You'll have uh, big, huge circuit tents out here. And each tent holds about 1,500 people. And they're all sitting there listening to one person tell a great story for about an hour. And when you walk down into town, everything's quiet. Then all of a sudden, there's, a, there's an applause from this tent over here. Or there's some laughing over here. A way off, you hear something else. So it's completely different from the uh, music festivals, uh, but uh, very, very kind of a kind of a strange, strange uh, feeling to be inside of town. Everything's quiet except for the train that might come by, and then there's a big applause over here, and uh, you say, "Wow, I'm at a I'm at a storytelling festival." <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure the, the first storytelling festival that you went to, that must have been pretty surprising to see after going to these various music festivals and then, you know, quiet except for, you know, applause or laughter here and there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you, uh, for your listeners out there as well, if you never experienced a storytelling festival, there's a certain magic in the air that uh, you, you can't explain. You have to go and experience that magic. Um, and to see an old mountain man like Ray Hicks, uh, that stood about six foot five, sprawled out all over the stage and telling a story. And at first you're not, you really can't understand him because it's his mountain draw is so thick and everything. But by the time you get about halfway through the story, you're kind of picking it up a little bit. And to look around and see 2000 people just watching him tell that story, it's, it's a, uh, the only thing I can equate that to is, uh, I don't know if you have any children or not, but 
uh, it's sort of like reading a book to your child, you know, and it's that it's that connection you have between you, uh, your child, and the book, and uh, it, it's it's a sort of kind of warm feeling like that. So it's amazing. So what it seems like, you know, one of the things that makes a really good storyteller is that they can, you know, captivate an audience and that, especially like an audience of 2000 people here in this case, but, you know, otherwise, what are some other characteristics that you feel really are indicative of, you know, this is a master storyteller or this is an accomplished storyteller? Oh, uh, very well practiced, but that cap captivating an audience is being able to hook them early uh, so once you get them, you can, uh, you can fairly keep them pretty good. Uh, you keep them, uh, their interest pretty good if you just keep rolling and you know your story well. Uh, and of course, a story is not uh, something you memorize word to word. Uh, it is something you you know. It's, it's sort of like sort of like giving somebody directions, you know, from my house to your house, or, and uh, you just go through that that these parts of the story, beginning, middle, and end, all the way through. And of course, each time you tell it, you add more details, uh, you take out some things. So it just keeps getting better and better. There are stories I've been telling for over 35, 40 years that uh, I'm amazed at how I keep working those stories. It's just, it's just wonderful. <laughs> Do you feel that you kind of like change up stories too, depending on both where you're at or the audience that you're working with or audience that you're presenting to? I'm sorry, I have to hear that again. Do you feel that you sometimes, you know, change up a story that you're telling depending on which audience and potentially where you're at? Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, uh, maybe change it up with different details, time, there's a time factor in there as well. And uh, there are some stories that I can tell to uh, small children at least elementary school age children and adults. And uh, of course, when I tell them to adults, there's a lot more detail added there and the story might be twice as long. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let me see the story everybody knows, the monkey's paw. And uh, I generally tell that story to middle school, high school kids, because after all, the, the, the kid in the story He's about their age. He's the one that dies, you know, it's, it's buried. Uh, that story generally for uh, for that group is about 30 minutes long or so. But if I do an adult version of that, it's uh, about 40 minutes long. And of course, I wouldn't tell that in uh, elementary school. What's a good way, to, good way to get run off, I guess you could say. Uh, there's, there's a couple of stories that just don't work, a, a number of them. And uh, so that, that would be an example. So yeah, I change up stories a lot. Depends on how much time you have. And uh, sometimes I just have a story I want to go into, I really want to tell. And uh, the the uh, host might tell you, we only have about 10 minutes left. And it's really a really great story, about 20 minutes long. But uh, you can make it work uh, without you know speeding it up too very much. Yeah, I imagine that would be pretty well-learned trait that just comes after experience, right, of knowing when okay, the person is tapping their watch, I only have 10 minutes, and this I need to pull back on the story that, I, that I'm telling here. That seems to be something that like takes some time to get, right, or understand. Yeah, you know, the uh, International Storytelling Festival, they're, they're known for being real sticklers on time, and if they tell you you've got 28 and a half uh, minutes, if you have 28 and a half minutes, you know, so um, kind of know what you're doing before you get up there. So yeah, that, do you also feel too that with storytelling and music that these are two things that are pretty intertwined from your, from your experience? Oh, uh, what I do is I, I sometimes do, um, my program might be music with some stories. Uh, and occasionally I might uh, use my musical instrument uh, with my stories as well. Uh, they kind of fit together. It's always amazed me. I think David Holt once said this as well. Uh, amazed how you can do one song for three minutes 
and people are, you know, they're good with it. That's three minutes on, you know, makes you feel good, makes you dance, makes you sad, might have a good uh, storyline in it as well. And then uh, you do a story that's 20 minutes long and people just kind of locked into you. And, uh, it, you know, it was 20 minutes long. It wouldn't be able to play that same song for 20 minutes that I would not work. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's kind of what I do. I kind of mix it up. It depends on the crowd that I'm, uh, I'm with, of course. So little ones, uh, you know, it's the different, it's different altogether. Attention spans, uh, with a, uh, with elementary school age, uh, I have a, a different set of programs than I do with uh, high school. It's sort of kind of fun to go into a middle school or high school because I tell this great story called uh, uh, The Boo Hack. And it's about 40 minutes long. I don't have to carry any musical instruments in. I don't have to carry any extra stuff. I just walk in, like most of my storytelling friends. And uh, the mic's mine for 40 minutes, 45 minutes. I do a short little you know, introduction, tell this story, I'm through, ready to go home. <laughs> and uh, and sometimes I say, wow, that was, that was fun. I don't have to worry about tuning up, setting up, or, or sound checking as, as much. Got one one mic. And uh, so I enjoy that, that a lot. It also sounds too, because you're also um, an accomplished teacher, correct? Or you've been teaching for quite a while. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy that. Sometimes I, I, I dread it when I'm putting everything together. But, uh, I really like to be around the young folks. I like to see them learn, see their wheels turn, and see them doing things for the very first time and experiencing that. And that's, that's uh, I guess that's the teacher side in me that uh, I, really, uh, I really enjoy. Uh, there's a there's a connection of feeling there that I just, that I can't explain. It's a great warm type feeling. I like that with a, a teaching all ages as well. The youngest of the young or, or the old, even the adults uh, too. Uh, if we're instrument building or, or if we're doing something with storytelling and seeing lights turn on for the very first time and, and i know that i'm doing a good job and they're having a good time they're learning something and we never stop learning so that's a great thing and you know on that same time deal you know it's very clear that you that you enjoy teaching this to the next generation and for you personally you know what do you see as the importance of continuing you know these stories these tunes these knowledge of uh, instrument building and everything, et cetera, with which you've done, you know, what do you see as the importance of continuing that onto the next generation? Yeah, so storytelling, uh, as well as music, it just it comes from a, a different direction. Storytelling is a, uh, a teaching apparatus. Uh, and I have to remind myself that because the next generation that comes up, they have never heard these stories. And uh, so it's all new to them. And uh, and so I enjoyed those connections uh, there. Uh, I like, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, teaching is a, is a fun thing to do, especially when you know a good bit of what you're, what you're working on with teaching. Uh, a couple of years ago, I worked with a whole school district where we made these single string dulcimers. And uh, it was out of a, a piece of wood about this, this long and one string and we used um, staples for the frets and so the so the kids took the uh, instruments and this was all a one day workshop of course I was with them all day long and this gifted talented uh, uh, you know children about eight or ten years old and they took and painted them up and just designed their own dulcimers. And of course, I helped them with the gluing and put the staples in. That staples have to be in the exact right place. Uh, while they're off for doing their lunch, I stringed them up, uh, each, each one of the instruments. And so, some of these classes had 20 dulcimers. So we worked on this all day long. So by the end of the day, they had a single string dulcimer. But, and so I showed them how, how to play it. 
And uh, by the time I left, uh, they knew two or three songs and was ready to take them home and, and experiment with them. So I guess the reason I'm telling you this is because they got to do a lot of things for the very first time, sanding and painting and design work and, and uh, uh, work a little bit with math if they wanted things to be a certain design, you know, only, you know, if they wanted things to be exact. Uh, and then learn a little bit about music as well and learn a song. So I covered a lot of things all in that one whole day that uh, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. And, and plus they got a little art in there as well. And uh, if you ever see me draw, you know I'm not an art, art teacher, but they did real well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great because it sounds like you're teaching like a whole set of classes just within you know one frame, like you said, like teaching math, teaching geometry, teaching art, teaching history, teaching music. This all seems to come together and you know through kind of passing on and teaching these traditions. Yeah, yeah, that uh, yeah, it's a uh, it, it's just all kind of together, and that that was that was a fun residency, and of course uh, I did the whole uh, school district of about eight schools. I'm gonna say 550 dulcimers that we we put together and made and learned to play. <laughs> That's amazing! Wow. <laughs> yeah, all all within you know a couple couple months. Yeah. So that's that's uh, very enjoyable. Yeah. Do you feel that that is kind of the uh, the most enjoyable aspect of teaching? You know, you know, see kids that are learning for the first time the various music or kind of um, interacting with these instruments that possibly, especially now, I'd imagine that they may never have heard of before. Yeah, and, and uh, 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 of course, I brought my dulcimer in and I played on a few tunes so I could see a full, full dulcimer. And I'm sure that some of the children, I think one child did, did say to me, I know what I'm getting for my birthday or I know what I'm getting for Christmas. And, <laughs> and, and uh, so you pass it on because a lot of these students uh, uh, play it's their first string instrument that they're playing. And and uh, and so you never know where that, where that will go, where that will take them. I think that's what teachers uh, hear a lot. They, they're walk, you know, teachers are in, in a grocery store and somebody comes up that's like 25 years old. Hey, do you remember me? And of course, it's hard to remember everybody, but I remember you told us this or you showed us how to do that. I never will forget that. So you're really, you're changing lives mm -hmm. for, for the good. That's wonderful. And, you know, as we start to get towards the end here and, you know, if there's anyone that wants to ask questions, feel free to throw it on out. I'll be related to, to John, but kind of, you know, wrapping up here, for you personally, what do you, what do these traditions mean to you? You know, what does, you kind of talked about a little bit where you're interested in finding out your Appalachian identity and your Appalachian roots. But for you personally, you know, with both this music and with storytelling, you know, what what does it mean to you? And, you know, how has it, this is probably a softball question or probably a goofy question, but you know, how has it impacted your life and what does it mean to you? Yeah. But, um, uh, Storytelling and folk music or traditional type music uh, is I'm very passionate about, uh, passionate about the history. Uh, and, um, you know, how, how, how it, it continues to be uh, rep, re represented, uh, represent, you know, over, over the uh, years. Um, and I, there's never a time that I, um, I get tired or bored with the music and uh, with the stories as well. It's just, it's, it's part of what I do. I, I live what I do, but it's a seven, uh, 24 seven uh, job. I'm, uh, I'm, content, I'm still learning a lot of things, meeting a lot of interesting uh, people, fine musicians. You can see the young people coming up and they're, changing the music a little bit and but they're carrying it on from one generation to the next and one of the things i do um we didn't talk about i'm a uh, 25 year uh, uh, broadcaster with uh, wncw radio out of spindale north carolina it's a great little radio station and i do an old-time radio show 
where I get to play the early old time, old timey tunes, the fiddle tunes of the 1920s and uh, 20s and 30s as well. It's a great uh, radio station. You ever want to check it out? It's at WNCW.org and uh, it's a wonderful station. Are you familiar with that station by any chance? Not too familiar, but I'm about to get familiar later uh, after the call here. I, I think you play the, uh, the squeeze box or did you say you played played an instrument? Yeah, I play occasion accordion poorly, but I play it. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Celtic music? A little bit. Okay, well, uh, they have, we have a great Celtic uh, show, three-hour Celtic show on Sunday afternoon between 12 and 3 o'clock. So uh, it's, uh, it's a great NPR uh, station. I'll definitely have to check that out. And I, the thing that I wanted to ask, too, before we leave is that you've also done a lot of – this might be a whole other tangent. I apologize. But, oh, that's fine. Um, no, <laughs> you've done a, a ton of um, – archival work, correct? Collecting, you know, fiddle tunes, and fiddle recordings back in the day. I love to just hear about that and, you know, how you got into that. Sure. Uh, again, very young and discovering the music and reading about the uh, collectors that went into the mountains and uh, really all over the place, uh, collecting stories and music uh, uh, and, uh, and, and folklore, folk, folk life. Uh, I, I really got interested in that very young. I started doing some archival work and research work. One of my early record, recordings or, or early pieces of work, which I still have here, is I went around to all the textile uh, mills and talked to some of the old timers uh, about, about their uh, experience working the mills and their stories. And, and uh, that's where I got to meet an awful lot of uh, interesting individuals and learn about the history of, of, of this area. I, I worked in Spartburg and that was called Mill People's Way. So I took a cassette, wrote a grant, I forgot how much grant was, it was a small grant, $500. I was able to produce a small uh, snipping of, of people talking about, you know, living on the mills or what their beliefs or their religions or whatever they want to talk about, just, just little snippets. That went to uh, to another project with South Carolina ETV, and uh, we did a 30-minute uh, program uh, and went and interviewed some of the same people, uh, and, and they did a really great, uh, great uh, NPR type, or, or excuse me, a public TV type of uh, type of presentation there. Uh, and the, I was kind of proud of that. They used that, that CD that led to, led to uh, us doing some more folk life uh, work with that. So I worked with them for a while. Later on, I got into music and uh, started uh, doing some field work. And one of my projects was this project here. It's called, uh, it's called Fiddle Traditions. And I started out not knowing what I wanted to do with it, just going around and meeting and uh, recording some of the old fiddlers. I recorded a lot of fiddlers, but I was able to put about eight on this this collection. And I think it was Greg Stinson that was doing uh, doing a talk here in Spartanburg at the library about collecting folk life or or something. And I met and talked with him afterwards. And I told him what I was interested in doing about, with the fiddle project. And it was around 2001, maybe. And he thought it was an excellent idea. I said, I wanted to go around and collect all, as much as I could, music from these old timers that were 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. And these people would have fiddled differently. They had different stories. Um, and of course, uh, uh, how they learned and everything. And so I continued that project, and then in 2003, I was able to release uh, this this CD, which actually sold, sold national. Uh, it was fun. So I met a lot of fiddlers. Uh, met a fourth cousin of mine. I guess when it gets to be fourth cousin, that we're all kin to each other. <laughs> and uh, Vernon Riddle was uh, was uh, uh, one of my informants. Uh, 
very good fiddle player. I did some writing about him uh, as well, and collected a good bit of his music. Um, I was at a, I was actually, I was at a jam session playing a banjo, and he asked me my name. I told him, you know, I'm John Fowler, and he said, "Well, I, I, we might be keen because I've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I was a little boy, my uh, cousin came, came to live with us for a year." because his mother had passed away and that, that cousin happened to be my grandfather and so uh, i kind of figured it out that fourth cousin line so Vernon riddle was one of them there were a lot of other ones out there bobby fulbright from union south carolina as well charles summer uh too a very good fiddle player one of, one of my i think one of my important finds was uh important finds was T.C. Foster. He's about 92 years old. And I'd heard about T.C. for about a year. And you, you being a folklorist, you know exactly the frustration, the hunting down people. And I and somebody would tell me, well, he, he jams at this, you know, he comes every week, he, can, he jams here. And, I, and sure enough, the week I went, he didn't come. He wasn't there. <laughs> and it was those kind of things. I was, felt like I was chasing a ghost around, but he was a fun guy, about 92 years old, and uh, a character, uh, but he played the fiddle. And uh, his story was that when he was a little boy, his father played. And great, great to find that uh, out as well, because I talked to him about his father's fiddle tunes and how his father played the bo uh, bowed the fiddle and everything. And his father would say, now, whatever you do, don't touch my fiddle. He slide his fiddle up under the bed. And uh, of course, uh, TC, as a little boy, he would watch this osmosis thing was going on. He just watched this absorb all what he was listening to. So he'd take the fiddle out and play it a little bit, but I always put it back in the right spot, you know, and did this for years. And uh, TC told me that uh, when he was about 17 years old, uh, he was in there just playing his father's fiddle and his dad walked in on him. And he stopped, looked at his dad. He thought his dad was going to give him what for whatever. And, he's, and uh, his dad said, well, damn boy, you better than me. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's how he learned. And that was in 1927. And I was able to capture him. The fun part about uh, capturing a lot of these music, uh, a lot of these uh, musicians on here is that most of them have never done any, uh, most or all of them have never done any, uh, uh, you know, commercial recording at all. They didn't have CDs, albums, or anything like that. So I was giving them something as well and collecting our music history uh, too. So one of these days, maybe 50 years from now, somebody might want to know what old time fiddling sounded like in the, uh, late 20th century, uh, maybe this CD, they'll stumble on it somewhere out there as well um, and be able to use it. That's great. So fun project. And I worked on some other projects too, but that, that was one of my one of my big babies there. That's wonderful. Before we go, I wanted to see if I can get Bob Owens on the call here. He wanted to give you a quick plug. So Bob Owens, let's see if I can get you on here. Okay. I don't know, but you are muted, Bob. So you can unmute yourself. Hopefully, we can hear you. It lets you unmute. Great. Um, if if not, oh, let's see if we can hear you, Bob. Shall I unmute it? Oh, I don't have any, don't have any luck hearing you, Bob. I'm sorry. Let's give it a couple more moments, but then afterwards we might just have to, to move on. If you want to give a plug, you can throw it on into the, uh, the text chat or text yeah, yeah. Chat, here, chat here. So yeah, unfortunately, apologize, Bob, we can't hear you. So I'll, have to uh, just mute you real quick. 
all this technology out there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're all learning together. And yeah. Fortune doesn't work out sometimes. Yeah, and uh, each, uh, each person you're working with is a different technology challenge, I'm sure, out there. And these, these live shows, you just never know what you're going to get. It's kind of a little bit like radio. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole it's a whole new learning learning uh, landscape. You know, who would have thought that a year or in less than a year we'd be continuing these conversations on uh, on computers and on on Zoom? But you know, that's We're the, the yeah, way you the and I, yeah you, uh, you and I talked a little bit about uh, you know my my field work. Uh, it was always fun to go and meet these people, sit with them, play with them a little bit, and uh, and, and get to know them and then then later on come back for an interview mm -hmm. because that's really that's really when you really can get some great stuff uh, uh, from uh, uh, from people from folks yeah well I remember you saying too before the call that you know with you interviewing these people did it kind of go from that story that you're telling me that you would kind of just stop at these small towns in South Carolina and just figure out you know why was this town? here how did it get established and then you kind of find people from there yeah yeah uh, i think <clears throat> i think of the town of inman south carolina which was uh uh which really just started as a uh, as they, they had had places that that the trains would stop along the tr uh, line when they built the uh built, built the line from spartanburg all the way up to Asheville and beyond so every so often, whatever it was, 50 miles, 20 miles, uh, they would uh, create these little stops. And I think the surveyor or somebody that was uh, laying the tracks out or something, his name was Inman. So they named that stop Inman. Uh, and then town sprang up around there because there's no one there by the name of Inman. And of course the textile mills came along later on. Uh, but yeah, when I pull into an uh, old town, especially an old little town, big towns, you can't, you know, the stories there, but you can't find it. But a little, little old town, train run, track runs right through the middle. We start looking at the names on the buildings and start trying to figure out, you know, why is this town here? The farming, textile town, manufacturing, you know, could, be, could have been anything. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, kind of from there, we, we've hit our time here. So I just wanted to just say here real quick, thank you again to everyone that joined us this evening. Uh, and John for sharing your music and your knowledge with us tonight. And tune in next Friday at 7 p.m. on Facebook to see John Eller perform as part of our Quarantine's Music series, which will be conducted, I believe, with assistance from the Pickens County Library System. And thank you again to the South Carolina Arts Commission for their support of Meet the Artist in Quarantines. And thank you for tuning in, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.